Good morning, and grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are so thankful that you've decided to join us in worship here at First United Methodist Church, Cherryville. Where, wherever you may be, however you may be with us this morning, we want to make sure that you feel welcomed here. Now, I, I do have a couple of announcements for us this morning. Uh, first off, this, this week for the Backpack Ministry, we're asking you to bring corn and green beans. Y'all did wonderful with the mac and cheese. We, we are now well blessed uh, with mac and cheese. So we're asking you to bring in some corn and green beans as you go grocery shopping, as you go throughout your travels this week. Uh, we are again doing hot dogs this week. So if you are hungry, if you know someone who is hungry, uh, please send them our way. Have them call the church. We'll make sure they get the finest hot dog and chili and slaw, chips and a cookie and all of Cherryville. Uh, also, Bess Thornburg's uh, UMK lesson is up on our church Facebook page. It's also on our church website. We hope that you'll watch that. We know that you'll enjoy it. There will be another one up this upcoming Wednesday at 5. Uh, Betsy Beatty is continuing to work with us, uh, drawing us deeper into the parables of Jesus, those strange uh, and sometimes hard to dig into stories that Jesus told, and she's helping us uh, explore our faith deeper with that. I hope you'll watch her adult Sunday school lesson. And, and then Linda Barger, our choir director, has uh, been doing her uh, hymn studies and, and then singings on Wednesday. And so I hope that you'll watch that. Now, brothers and sisters, as we enter into this time of worship, it is our sincere hope and prayer that you feel the grace and the warmth and the love of Jesus Christ. Let us come together to worship God in both spirit and in truth. Thank you so much, Nancy. Friends, as we come to this time of prayer in our worship service, we're going to begin with a time of silent prayer, then we'll have a spoken prayer, then we'll come together for the Lord's Prayer. Brothers and sisters, let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, you who invite us not simply into your kingdom, but into relationship with you, we give you thanks for the blessing of a new day. Thanks for your grace, thanks for your love, and thanks for this time of holy worship. We pray that you will use this time of worship to shape and form us more into the kind of disciples that you have called us to be. Lord God, your Son, Jesus Christ, came pronouncing a new way of life. He came to call us to embrace the kingdom, way of life, and in the kingdom he calls us to be disciples, to be those who not only proclaim their faith with our mouths, but to be those who live our faith with our actions. Forgive us when we fail to live as the disciples you have called us to be. Forgive us when we treat our faith as if it is just something we think about. Empower us to live our lives as agents of the kingdom of God here and now, so that we might reach others with the transformative news of your grace and the profound good news of your love. 
Heavenly Father, we know that your world stands in turmoil. We see the ways that this virus has crippled us. It has robbed us of our health. It has robbed us of our security. And yet with everything it has taken from us, we know that it can't take you. We know that you are in charge. We pray for your healing and restoration. We pray for all those who are lost, that they would find their way back to you. We pray for all those who have no one to pray for them, that they would be reminded in your sight and in your love they are valuable and precious. And here this morning, O Lord, we lift before you Bob and Judy, Mike and Janet, Julie and Vera, Jim and Ruth, Sherry and John, Ken and Bertha, Ara Ann and Larry, Carlene and the Putnam family, Chris and Gary, Billy and Earlene, Don and Martha, Wanda and Cindy, Miles and Rhett, Lisa and Teresa, Dan and Melissa, Kenneth and Beverly, Angela and Martha Jane, Ethan and Aaron, Jessica and Cody, and all those names and situations, Lord, that we hold on our hearts, we place them into your holy hands. We lift before you on this day the leaders of Cherryville, of Gaston County, of the state of North Carolina, the United States and the world. We pray that those in leadership would look to you for guidance and discernment. And we pray for all those who love and serve their communities. We pray that they may feel your strength as they seek to love their neighbors. We pray for our soldiers for their safe return and for an end to war. And now, as those who are called to be both hearers and doers of our faith, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now it's my joy to invite Bess Thornburg up for a children's sermon. Hey guys, how are you today? I hope everybody's had a good week. You know, it was the first week of back to school. I hope you had a really, really good week at school. I brought my backpack with me because I had all my stuff. Oh, gosh, my stuff for school. I saw many of you with your picture, with your little backpack or your little book satchel things, all the stuff you were taking to school. For a lot of them said first day of preschool or first day of kindergarten or first day of middle school. And I bet even some of those that said first day of senior year were a little bit nervous about that first day. It's a new year. It's all a new experience with the way everything's been going. But you know, sometimes you wonder, will I make new friends? I'll have a new teacher. I'll have a new classroom. I'll have a whole new school. Things are going to be a little bit different. And sometimes that makes us have what I call the back to school jitters just a little bit. Well, on the first day of school, I bet your teacher asks some questions of you. Sometimes a teacher wants to ask questions so they can see kind of how much you already know when you got to their class. They might have asked if you knew your colors or they might have given you a math problem to do. They might have asked you some kind of question just to kind of see what you knew. Well, our Bible school, um, I mean Bible story today talks about a time when the disciples went back to school. Yes, the disciples went to school sometimes. I wonder if you can guess who their teacher was. You're right. Their teacher was Jesus. And he would often take them aside and teach them lessons about God's kingdom. 
So today we're going to talk about one of those times when Jesus was teaching the disciples. And he asked them a question. He said to them, when he was teaching them, he said, Who do men say that I am? You ever thought about that? Well, you know what? I can just see one of those disciples going, uh, me, me, I know, I know, I know. You ever do that? That kind of takes away the jitters when you know the answer to something. And I bet he's going, me, I know, I know. And he said, you are John the Baptist. And I think another disciple probably said, I, I, no, 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 that, I know, I know, I know it, I know the answer. He said, some people say you are Elijah. And then I bet a third disciple said, I, I, I know, I know this answer. I really, really know this answer. You're Jeremiah, the prophet. Some people have said, you're Jeremiah. Well, Jesus said, well, that's well and good, guys, but... You know, that's not really what I ask. I ask, who do you say that I am? And you know what? I bet that Peter, he probably forgot to raise his hand, and he just blurted out. He just blurted it out just right out loud. He said, you are the Christ. You are Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said, you are right, Peter. You are right, but how did you know that? You didn't learn that because that's who men say I am. You learned that from your heavenly Father, from having the Holy Spirit in your heart is how you knew that. Well, it makes me wonder as we go back to school and start a new year, we will probably run into people who do not know who Jesus Christ was. We'll run into people who don't know Jesus at all. What will we tell them? I know what you will tell them because you know in your heart who Jesus is. But I hope that you're ready to tell them about Jesus and about that he is the Son of God. He's the one that died for us. He's Jesus Christ. And I hope you take Jesus Christ with you to school this year and remember how much he loves us and all the things he taught us. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, when people are searching for the answer to the question, who is Jesus, help us to be ready with the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Amen. Thank you, Bess. I like your book bag. <laughs> our, our scripture today, it comes to us from the letter of James. Chapter 1, verses 17 through 27. And I invite you to hear now these words of instruction that James gives to us. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they're like those who look at themselves in the mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for the orphans, 
and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you all join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to come together and to be your church. Father, we pray that your word would live within us, that it would move us, and that it would draw us deeper into relationship with you and deeper into relationship with one another. For Lord, it is in your name. And in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Well, y'all, I I want you to do something for me this morning. What I want you to do is I want you to think about the last time you saw a really good deal on something. Whether that was on the TV, maybe it was on the radio, maybe it it was on the computer. You saw a deal for, for a TV, for a car, for a computer. Just really, really deep discounts. What did you do when you saw that good deal? See, I'm willing to bet that you either went to the store to check out for yourself if if this deal was real, or you called someone else and you said, can you believe they're selling X, Y, or Z for for this price? You know, as people, there's, there's not many things that we love quite as much as a good deal. It'll really get us to react. You drop the price, hey, we're all about it. You know, I remember as a a child, we used to get the Sunday newspaper. And and my mom would always cut out the coupons and stick them in this big kind of accordion folder. And her favorite coupons were the Belk ones. And inevitably, she would go to Belk and she would come back, arms just full with bags. And my dad would say, honey, how much money did you spend today? And she'd say, it's not about how much I spent, Paul. It's, It's about how much I saved. Would you believe I saved $500 today, and all I had to spend was $300 to do it. You know, in her mind, she's coming out $200 ahead. It's all about the deal, right? For Crystal and I, it's not not so much material things that that really get us responding to them. No, it's, it's more food. Several weeks ago, got an email from Chili's. It said, "Take five dollars off our two for twenty. That's right. Two appetite or two entrees, one appetizer for fifteen dollars." I went home that evening to Crystal and I said, "How do you feel about going to Chili's tonight?" She said, "That sounds wonderful. You got the email too." I said, "I did." So we threw the kids in the car. We braved Dallas Cherryville Highway, braved 321, braved I-85, went to Gastonia, went into Chili's. We parked in the parking lot, waited for about 15 minutes for them to bring us our food. We put it in the back of the car and drove back home. Whole excursion took us about an hour and a half, but you know, it was such a deal. Say $5 on a supper, it was such a deal. My, my point is this, as people, we're, we're great at hearing and responding to things. And, and it doesn't just have to be advertisements or material things. If, if somebody calls you up and says, I heard about this great fishing spot, what do you do? You, you throw your fishing rod in the car and you go fishing. Somebody tells you about a great new golf course, what, what do you do? You throw your clubs in the car, you go play it. Somebody tells you about a new recipe, what do you do? You go home and you make it. We are great at hearing and responding to just about everything. Just about everything that is except for matters of our faith. See, we're great about hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. Oh, we love to hear those words of Jesus Christ. We love it when he puts the Pharisees in their place. We love it when he takes on the religious elite. We love to hear that. But the problem comes when we are called to actually do it. You see, it's one thing to hear Jesus say, you should love your neighbor as yourself. That's wonderful, great idea. Something completely different to go out and love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's one thing to hear Jesus say, you should love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. But it's something completely different when there's someone who wishes you harm to go out and to love them and to bless them. Hearing 
and doing. It's so important, and, and yet oftentimes it's so hard. And, and, and that's not just a, a feature of the 21st century. It's been true in churches for a long time. And in, in fact, that's kind of the impetus for James's letter to his churches. See, the churches James is writing to, they've come to a place where they have relegated their faith to, to some vague kind of form of spirituality. People are content to come and hear the stories of Jesus. They like coming to church. But when they leave, they leave the exact same as they walk through the doors. The stories of Jesus, they don't impact their lives. They don't change the way that they live and interact in the world. They're great at hearing, not great at doing. So James writes to address this problem. And, and, and y'all, the letter of James, it's one of the most unique letters that that we have in the New Testament. You might be familiar. Paul writes most of the letters in the New Testament. He writes 13. John writes 4. Peter writes 3. Then you have Jude and Hebrews and James. So chances are when you come to the epistles in the New Testament, you're not reading from James. You're, you're reading from Paul or John or Peter. Which is a shame because James is just so much different. You, you know, when Paul writes, Paul writes in a very reactionary kind of way. Paul, Paul's writing to address some issue or situation or circumstance that's come up in one of his churches. Sometimes he, he writes in ways that he calls people out by name. He makes these very long, high-minded theological arguments to, to address the issues in his church. They're, they're good, but sometimes it's easy to get lost in them. Hebrews, on the other hand, tries to connect the Old Testament and the New Testament with Jesus being the thread that holds it all together. And It's wonderful, but but if you're not really familiar with the Old Testament, you might have a problem getting through Hebrews. I I don't know many people today who are very familiar with the high priesthood of Melchizedek, but, but you have to be to understand Hebrews. It's a long, complicated book. Important, but complicated. The way James chooses to address the problems in his community, though, James, he doesn't write long, complicated arguments. Instead, James takes a page from Solomon. James addresses the issues in his church by writing Proverbs. And, and you got to love a proverb. The, the beauty of a proverb is, is that it's a short statement, typically only one or two sentences that's meant to distill a deeper truth. They're supposed to be short and sweet so that you can call back to them quickly. So that you can always bring them up in the back of your mind and they help you navigate through life. And that's why some of the Proverbs that we have in the book of Proverbs are so impactful. Train up a child in the way they should go and when they're old they will not stray from it. Beautiful advice. Two sentences easy to call back to. We have cultural proverbs where where we say things like, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now, no one ever asks you to explain that. No one ever asks you to interpret that for them. No, we know it to be true. In, In the scripture that we read this morning, we had four such proverbs. Four in ten verses. The first, every gift comes from God and every gift is useful in the building up of the kingdom of God. Secondly, be quick to listen and slow to anger, for anger does not produce God's righteousness. Third, be not only hearers of the word, but be doers. And fourth, pure religion is this, to take care of the widowed and the orphan, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Four perfect pieces of advice, four pieces of advice that are important for us to keep in mind if we want to live the kind of lives that Jesus Christ has called us to. But, but, but this morning, I want us to focus on that third proverb, chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Be not only hearers of the word, but be doers. And to be fair, you could say that this is kind of the theme of the book of James as a whole. It's it's in James where we get that wonderful line that drove Martin Luther crazy. Faith without works is dead. James will go on to explain that if you see someone freezing to death on the street and you got two coats at your house and you say, I'll pray for you, but you don't give them a coat, then, then what good is your faith? He says, be not only hearers of the word, be doers. And I know that sounds really simple. 
Sounds like something you get the first time you walk into Sunday school. It, it, it seems like Christianity 101, just kind of baby steps. But, but y'all, sometimes it's those basic steps that we tend to forget. It, it's so easy to get to a place in our lives where we compartmentalize our faith. Where, where we put our faith in a box and, and we take that box down each Sunday when we come to church or when we watch church or when we read scripture, we set that box down and we pour all these aspects of our faith into that box and after we're done, when we leave, we, we just stick it back up there until we can take it back out next Sunday. We, we keep it just there nice and safe because the faith that Jesus Christ calls for us, friends, it, it can be incredibly inconvenient. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to live in, in somewhat direct opposition to the ways of the world. For the way our world is set up today, it's, it's more or less survival of the fittest. Everyone looks out for themselves. And, and in that regard, we can look at someone who's hungry and say, well, you better find some food. Someone who's thirsty, you better find something to drink. Someone who's homeless and say, well, you better find some shelter, but... But because it doesn't affect me personally, I'm not that worried about it. Everyone's got to look out for number one. Our motivating factor is the self. Jesus says, that's not the way it is for you as a disciple. Jesus says, if someone's hungry, you better go feed them. If someone's thirsty, you better give them water. If someone is homeless, you better help them find shelter. And if someone doesn't know about Jesus Christ, you better go and tell them. Be not simply hearers of the word, be doers. See, James is worried that, that his congregation is going to miss out on a full expression of the faith. He, he's worried that they are going to miss out on the good news, on the gospel that Jesus Christ brought, not as some far off distant reality, but one that is here, that is present, to see the kingdom of God before them. If we stop at just hearing the good news as opposed to living the good news we never see just how real just how vibrant the holy spirit can be here and now james doesn't want his congregation to forget this james wants them to know that god has more in store for them than simply hearing the word he wants them to be actors be not only hearers be doers it seems so simple, but my friends, it is one of the most profound pieces of advice I, I think we can ever hear. Because if my faith renders me the same today as it did yesterday, what, what good is my faith? If my faith is not actively moving me out to love and lo love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love my neighbor as myself, it is something drastically different than the faith that Jesus Christ got crucified bringing to you and me. James says, be not only hearers of the word, be doers. In fact, James says, if, if we just stop at hearing, we're, we're like someone who looks at ourselves in the mirror, sees our reflection, and upon turning around, we immediately forget what we look like. But someone who not only hears but does is like someone who can always remember who they are. Remember whose they are. Remember that image of God that is implanted on each and every one of us. It says don't stop at just hearing. Don't let just hearing the good news of Jesus Christ be the end of your faith journey. Rather let it be the start. Put it into practice. Don't just read scripture. Let it change the way that you live in the world. And friends, as United Methodists, we, we have a really strong foundation on which we're built. And we're built on being not simply hearers of the word, but being doers. John Wesley started the Methodist movement because he was so tired of being in churches which he termed dead churches. Churches where folks came for an hour on Sunday, most took their naps, and then they left and went back to the world same as they came in. John Wesley said, this is not what Jesus Christ proclaimed. And so he started the Methodist movement. A, a way to connect hearing the gospel to practical application in a person's life. That's why John Wesley said, there's no holiness without social holiness. 
Meaning, we're, we're not meant to abstain from interaction with the world. Rather, we are meant to go out into the world and to change it. To live as agents of the kingdom of God here and now. Be not simply hearers of the word. Be doers. I know I've told you before, and I'll probably tell you again, but, but y'all, I, I love golf. It's probably my favorite sport. That or college basketball, they're, they're tied hand in hand. And, and I used to love watching golf, which, which drives my wife crazy. Uh, if she's never having trouble going to sleep at night, she'll pull up old Masters reruns, and she'll be asleep in about five minutes. But, but I used to love watching golf. These days, I don't get to do it that often. It, it's normally if I'm home, Paul Patrol or PJ Mask or Nursery Rhymes are on the TV, and it's not worth the fight to watch golf. But, but I've started when I'm in my office on Thursdays and preparing sermons or preparing Bible studies or preparing for, for the next week, I'll, I'll pull up the golf tournament that's currently happening, and I'll listen to the radio broadcast of it. And I've noticed something about myself, that, that just hearing a reporter, talk about the golf match that's currently going on. It, it enlivens something in me. If I just hear it for about five minutes, I've noticed I want to go and play golf. Now, now if simply hearing about golf can make me want to make that response, then, then why would I treat my faith any differently? Why would I just leave it at hearing? And I know it's probably not golf that causes that response in you, but, but there's something that does, that, that you just hear about it and you want to do it. You want to make a response to it. The challenge from James is for our faith to be what elicits that response in us. To not simply hear, to not be content with just hearing, but to be doers, to live our faith in order that this community and that this world might come to see the redemptive good news of Jesus Christ. James says, don't just be hearers, be doers. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you all pray with me? Good and gracious God, you love us so much that you have invited us not simply to be listeners to you. You have invited us to be participants with you. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would set our hearts on fire for you, that we might go to the ends of the earth to proclaim your name and to show your love. For it is in your holy name and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Don't you just love a rainbow? I've seen many in my life. It seems like I've seen many, but there are several that have stayed on my mind. Once in 1985, when I was the choir director at a church in Gastonia, I saw a great big double rainbow that I told the congregation about from the uh, pulpit one Sunday, and I had seen the double rainbow against a dark purple sky, and glittery golden leaves of autumn, and a glittery grain, a grain field. It was just an awesome sight, and on that day that I saw that, it just felt like me and God were there. The whole world had gone away. There was another time when I was with my grandson, Holden Page. I took him to an important ball game uh, that he played in. And during that ball game, if you've ever seen the movie The Natural, that's what he reminded me of because he hit a home run and it bounced off of the scoreboard under a double rainbow. Unbelievable, and the game took place on a mountaintop that I drove him to. So that was a very memorable night, not counting the flat tire I had on the mountaintop. <laughs> so 
But more recently, on this past Father's Day, I went to see my son, Billy Jack Barger, and a little while later on the way home, I saw a complete, full arch of a double, I mean, it wasn't double, it was a rainbow in the sky over the Cherville Water Tower out there at Walmart. So that was so awe-inspiring that I pulled my car over and I took some pictures and it was just beautiful. Well, the sight of a rainbow reminds me of God's promise to us and it must have reminded a Swedish minister also because back in not 1985, like I saw the rainbow, but 1885, 100 years before that, there was a young 26-year-old Swedish minister who had preached one Sunday, and he and his friends were walking home from church afterwards. And all of a sudden, a storm, a violent storm came up and the thunder cracked and the lightning streaked across the sky and the wind blew the flowers in the field, the leaves on the trees and grain, just like I saw a grain field, the wind blew the grain field in Sweden. So his name was Carl Boberg, a Swedish minister. And when he got home, he, and it, just as suddenly as the storm had come up, it subsided and everything was calm. And the birds sang in the trees and the colors were so vivid. And it was just a gorgeous day. And when he looked out across the sea, he saw a beautiful, gorgeous rainbow. And that inspired him to sit down and write a poem called How Great Thou Art. And in Swedish, it's called O Stor Gut. And about five years after, and he published it, he published the poem, and uh, he thought it was forgotten. It was later put to a Swedish folk song. And uh, it played for a while, but then about five years later, he was surprised to hear it. And a German had heard the song and translated it into German. And then years after that, uh, it was translated into Russian. And years after that, about 1991, an English minister and his wife decided to become missionaries to Poland. And while they were on mission, on the mission field, they heard the song in Russian. And this English, this British English uh, minister decided to, it inspired him to change it up a little bit. And he adapted it, the words to his words and the music to his music. And then in 1957, at the great Billy Graham crusade in New York City, this hymn was played and the great George Beverly Shea sang it 99 times and during the whole crusade. And the choir sang the chorus, How Great Thou Art. And during, I've been to all the Billy Graham Crusades that were around here. When I was 12 in Charlotte, I had to be in the auditorium with my family because we couldn't get in the Coliseum. And then uh, again, when I was a teenager, I went. And again, we had to be in the, Colise in the auditorium. And then in about the middle 1990s, I think it was 1997, I went, and the only seat I could find was up at the very top of the arena behind the choir. 
So I just belted out as loud as I could with the Billy Graham Choir. And it meant so much to me. And George Beverly Shea sang How Great Thou Art at my father's funeral. So as uh, I hope this has told you the story behind the song, behind the hymn, and that's what the choir and I are in the process of doing as Bo helps us with uh, broadcasting. And uh, here is How Great Thou Art. to how great thou art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden Gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great! thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Oh, 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 oh,
And now, brothers and sisters, we will receive the offering. Heavenly Father, we return to you a small portion of what you have so richly blessed us with. Lord, we pray that you would take these gifts of our tithes and of our offerings, and that you would use them how you see fit, that they might be to the benefit of your kingdom and to the glory of your holy name. For it is in your name and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, as we carry forth the light of Christ from this place on this day, I pray that you will receive this benediction. Go forth this week to be not simply a hearer of the Word of God, not simply a hearer of your faith, but to be a doer, to enact your faith in order that the light of Christ might be visible in you and in this world. For it is in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit we are sent. Amen.